Welcome to today's live reading from Ramayan, the story of Lord Ram. We are nearly going to conclude the Balkant today. It's been a long day, so I'm going to resume the reading now. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Mukam Karuti Vachalam. Pangum Langhaite Girim. Yat Kripa Tamam Vande. Shri Gurum Din Tarinam. Parmananda Madhavam. Shri Chaitanya Ishwaram. So yesterday we were reading about the marriage festivities were concluded for the four brothers with the four daughters of Janak and his younger brother Kushadhwaja and now we shall continue. After the day's festivities were concluded the marriage party retired for the night the next morning Vishwamitra left Mithila for the Himalayas and later that day Maharaj Dashrath departed with his four sons and their wives after receiving a large dowry from King Janak on the way back to Ayodhya Maharaj Dashrath observed the inauspicious signs of numerous fearful birds screeching overhead at the same time he saw the auspicious sign of deer crossing his path from right to left sorry from left to right Fearing some impending danger, the king inquired from Vashisht for some explanation. The Rishi replied, the screaming birds indicate some imminent danger. However, the deer crossing from left to right indicate there is no need to worry on that account. While Maharaj Dashrat and his priests were Thus discussing the matter, a fierce wind began blowing, shaking the very earth and knocking down many tall trees. Dust rose up and began to cover everything from all directions. It became so dark that nearly everyone except Maharaj Dashrath, his sons and Vashisht and the other rishis became bewildered and panic-stricken. Suddenly this famous and terrible warrior Pashuram appeared with matted hair, an axe on his right shoulder, a bow on his left and a powerful arrow in his hand hence the rishis were surprised to see parshuram in this ferocious aspect since previously after annihilating the kshatriya community 21 times he had vowed to give up his anger and remain fixed in the execution of austerities as the Rishis were wondering why he had again become moved to anger. The son of Jamdagni addressed Lord Rama as follows. You have certainly performed a heroic feat by breaking the bow of Lord Shiva. However, I am carrying an even greater bow, that of Lord Vishnu. If you consider yourself a great hero, then take this bow and string it. If you are able to draw the arrow back to its full length, then I shall consider you a fit person to fight with. Hearing Parshuram's challenge, Maharaj Dashrat became overwhelmed with grief. <clears throat> Afraid to lose his beloved son, with trembling voice, the king pleaded, O best of the rishis, Parshuram, please desist from your aggressive spirit. I beg to remind you of your vow to give up fighting. After handling, handing over the earth to Kashyap, you retired to Mount Mahendra to perform austerities. Parshuram, however, ignored Dashrat and continued to address Ram, saying, Both Lord Shiva's bow and his bow and this bow of Lord Vishnu were constructed by Vishwakarma. Lord Shiva was given one of the bows to kill Tripurasur. One day after Lord Shiva killed the demon, the demigods went to Lord Brahma and curiously inquired, Who is more powerful? Lord Shiva or Lord Vishnu. To resolve the doubt, Lord Brahma arranged to create some conflict between the two. As a result, a fierce battle ensued. During the fight, Lord Vishnu cut off Lord Shiva's bowstring and then, simply by releasing a tumultuous roar, he stunned Lord Shiva's senses. At the behest of the demigods, the fighting was then stopped. Everyone who witnessed the duel concluded that Lord Vishnu is superior to Lord Shiva in all respects. Lord Shiva, however, felt bitter because of his defeat and was consulted 
was insulted by the verdict of the demigods. Thus in gloom and disgust he gave away his bow to Devrat, a king in the line of Ikshvaku. Lord Vishnu gave away his bow to great Rishi, Richika, who later gave it to his son Jamdagni. However, my father never used that bow, for he had vowed not to retaliate against any wrong done to him. Thereafter, I received the bow from him, and after killing the Kshatriyas twenty-one times as revenge for Kartavirjuna slaying my father, I became the sole ruler of the earth. When Kashyap performed a great sacrifice so that I could make atonement for killing the Kshatriyas, I gave him the earth as his priestly reward and then retired to Mount Mahendra. While there I acquired great prowess by performing severe austerities. However, when I heard from you, heard that you had broken the bow of Lord Shiva, I felt compelled to come and challenge you. If you consider yourself a great hero, then take this bow and see if you are worthy of fighting with me. Without speaking, Rama accepted Parshuram's challenge by quickly snatching his bow and arrow from his hands and took it. Took with it his long-acquired ascetic prowess. Then, after effortlessly swinging the bow before the awestruck Parshuram, Ram drew the arrow back to its full length. Ram then declared, Because you are a Brahman and related to Vishwamitra, I shall not slay you, however, so that my taking up this arrow may not go in vain and your challenge may be properly answered, I will use it to destroy the attainment of heaven which you earned as a result of your penances. The demigods and celestial rishis assembled in the sky to witness Rama's shooting of the arrow. Parshuram had already been rendered impotent by Ram and all that he could do was gaze at the Lord with wide open eyes. Finally, as Rama continued to keep the arrow pulled back to his ear, Parshuram said in a subdued voice, After I gave, gave away the earth to Kashyap, he ordered me not to reside here any again. For this reason, I must leave before night falls. Although my access to heaven has been taken away, I beg you to at least allow me to return to Mount Mahendra so that I may continue my austerities. O Ram, I can now understand that you are the Lord Vishnu himself. Thus I am not ashamed at having met defeat at your hands. Rama silently accepted Parshuram's request and then released the mighty arrow, thus destroying the son of Jamdagni's eligibility for heaven, heavenly elevation. Thereafter, Parshuram returned to Mount Mahendra. As soon as he departed, the darkness previously created by uh, created completely dissipated from its position in the sky. The demigods glorified Lord Rama with great enthusiasm and showered him with fragrant flowers. Lord Ram then presented the bow of Lord Vishnu to Varun and the party thus continued on its way. Upon returning home, the four sons of Maharaj Dashrath began living very happily with their wives. After some time, King Yudhajit, the son of Kekai, and maternal uncle of Bharat and Shatrugna came to Ayodhya and invited his nephews to come and stay with him. After his two brothers departed for Kekai kingdom, Ram began serving his father and three mothers with great care. Ram also carried out the state administrative function so honestly that constantly and conscientiously that all the citizens came to love him dearly. Sita and Rama's natural attachment for each other grew day by day. They became completely dedicated to one another, be being bound by each other's beauty and good qualities. In truth, Sita was beauty incarnate, being the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi herself. Within her mind, Sita could vividly read everything in the innermost core of Ram's heart, being always determined to please her husband and acting as the emblem of womanly gentleness and chastity. Sita was soon able to bring the heart of Lord Ram under her control. So thus ends the 
Balkant from Ramayan and we will begin the Ayodhya Kant and read a little bit of it. Ayodhya Kant Bharat and Shatrugna remained with their maternal uncle Yudhajit for some time, being well entertained by him. Meanwhile at Ayodhya, Ram became the pet son of Maharaj Dashrath and the beloved of all the citizens. Ram was Lord Vishnu himself, incarnated within human society for the purpose of killing the wicked Ravan. As the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Ram exhibited himself as the reservoir of all good qualities. Rama's beautiful bodily features provided all who viewed him with the full satisfaction of their eyes. Ram played the part of a courageous and heroic Kshatriya, yet he was self-controlled, self-satisfied, without malice and gentle in word and deed. Ram did not take offence when criticised by others and was pleased by even the smallest show of kindness. He was forgiving and always humble about his position. Ram only embraced the association of persons who were pious and superior, of superior wisdom. He was considerate and always the first to welcome guests. Ram firmly adhered to the truth and honoured the Brahmanas. He loved the citizens and they loved him. Ram always acted according to religious principles and was learned in all scriptures. He epitomised youthful vigour and was a mature judge of character. Ram was always diligent in punishing wrongdoers and rewarding the virtuous. As a horseman and wielder of the bow, Ram excelled all others. And he was the greatest of the chariot warriors. Indeed, Ram was the lord of the three worlds and the controller of eternal time. He was unconquerable even by the greatest demigods and demons. Maharaj Dashrath had ruled his kingdom for 60,000 years, now having grown old and fatigued. He finally desired to retire from his royal duties to prepare himself for an exalted destination after quitting his body. However, Maharaj Dashrat began to see various omens for foreboding evil. Thus, he anxiously desired to install Ram as the heir apparent as quickly as possible. For this purpose, Maharaj Dashrath called a meeting of his ministers, prominent citizens and subordinate kings. However, in his haste, Maharaj Dashrath did not formally invite King Janak or Kekai, feeling confident of their support. Thereafter, when all were assembled, Maharaj Dashrath announced, I have grown old and now desire to hand the royal throne over to my eldest son Ram, who has reached the age of 27, it is now the sacred month of Chaitra and tomorrow the auspicious constellation Pushya will be ascending. Therefore, with your permission, I will direct that the ceremonies for installing Ram as the heir apparent begin tomorrow. The assembled ministers, kings and citizens all applauded Dashrat's proposal. Then they glorified Ram's incomparable virtues, equating him with Lord Vishnu himself equating him with Lord Vishnu himself. Thus Maharaj Dashrath was both pleased and relieved. After everyone departed, he requested Vashisht Muni to immediately begin, begin preparations for the installation ceremony. Vashisht then ordered the chief minister Sumantra to arrange for the city to be gorgeously decorated and make all other preparations so that the ceremonies could start early the next day. Maharaj Dashrath then summoned Ram to the royal assembly. Soon thereafter, Ram entered the royal assembly and came before his father. Approaching his father with folded hands, Ram fell flat at his feet, offering his respects. Maharaj Dashrath then picked up his son and, after tightly embracing him, said, My dear Ram, I have grown old and weary and feel it is now time for me to retire. I have sufficiently enjoyed all manner of royal opulences. I have performed innumerable sacrifices and I have distributed huge amounts of wealth to the Brahmanas. You, Ram, are my eldest and favourite son. Likewise, all the ministers and citizens love you dearly. Therefore, I have arranged that tomorrow you will be installed as the heir apparent to the royal throne. Hearing this, some of Ram's friends ran to Mother Kaushalya, hoping to be the first to deliver the wonderful news to her. Upon hearing the news, she became overjoyed and gave the bearers of the good tidings gold, jewels, and cows in charity. Thereafter, when Ram returned to his own palace, crowds of cheering citizens greeted him along the way. Meanwhile, Maharaj Dashrath entered his inner apartments 
to lie down for some rest. Just as the king was drifting to sleep, however, he experienced a recurring ominous dream. Waking with a start, he immediately sent Sumantra to summon Ram. The king felt apprehensive that there might be some obstruction to his son's planned installation. Hearing that his father had again called him, Ram also felt a degree of apprehension, making toward his father's palace with haste. Ram entered his father's room, inquiring that what was needed of him. Dashrath embraced Ram and said, My dear Ram, all my desires in life have been fulfilled except to see you installed on the throne. Unfortunately, due to the influence of the sun, Mars and Rahu, there is a very bad astrological period of, for me. Therefore, I have been experiencing disturbing dreams prompting me to think that a great calamity awaits me. Therefore, I am eager to expedite matters. I want the installation ceremonies to being, begin immediately even without the presence of your brothers Bharat and Shatrugna. You and Sita should fast tonight for purification then tomorrow in the early morning prepare yourself for the installation. Ram returned to his palace to inform Sita of the arrangements for the following day. Not finding her there however Ram went to the residence of his mother when Ram entered Koshalya's room, he saw her sitting with the closed, half-closed eyes and suspended breath, silently praying to her household deity, Lord Narayan, for Ram's good fortune. Koshalya was being attended by Lakshman and Sumitra got up to greet her son. Ram addressed her, saying, O mother, father wishes to install me as the heir apparent to the royal throne. With tears in her eyes, Koshalya replied, My austerities have certainly not been in vain. May you and Sita live long and happily together. Smiling, Ram turned to his brother Lakshman and said, My dear brother, you must rule the kingdom along with me, for you are like my second self. Indeed, I could not even think of finding happiness in royal luxury or even life itself without you. Thereafter, Ram returned to his palace in a jubilant mood. Sita and Ram worshipped Lord Narayan together and then lay down to take rest for the night. Meanwhile, the city, within the city, all the citizens were merrily engaged in preparing for the coming festivities. All the streets in Ayodhya were washed with perfumed water and scattered with fragrant flowers. Brilliant, colorful lights burned in every house and meeting place, turning night into day. The noisy crowd swelled like waves of the sea and the numerous elephants, horses and camels appeared to be like large aquatic animals within the ocean. At the time of Kekai's marriage to Maharaj Dashrath, her father Ashwapati, the king of Kekai, had given her a hunchbacked maidservant named Manthara. Manthara was actually an apsara, deputed by the demigods to appear on the earth to assist in the killing of Ravan. The evening before Ram's planned installation, Mantara went into the palace roof. From there, she could see the entire city of Ayodhya was splendidly decorated. The street crowded with citizens in a jubilant mood. Surprised at seeing this, Mantara approached Ram's former nurse and inquired, What occasion warrants such a celebration? Why do I see Koshalya in such a joyful mood and giving charity, lavish charity to the Brahmanas? The nurse happily replied, Tomorrow the constellation Pushya will be in the ascendant. Taking advantage of the auspicious time, Maharaj Dashrath will install Ram as his heir apparent to the royal throne. <clears throat> the unexpected news pierced the envious heart of Mantharas. Suspecting foul play by the king, she suddenly became enraged and thus sought Kekai. Surprised at finding her mistress peacefully lounging on the couch in her apartment, Mantra exclaimed, Get up, get up, you fool. You can't see the disaster that is about to engulf you. Are you so deluded by your husband's sweet words that you do not realize what is happening before your eyes? Keke innocently replied that she could find no fault in her husband's plans. This, however, only further enraged Mantra, having mastered the out of persuasive speech, Mantra then spoke to Kekai in a way that eventually caused her to doubt her husband. Posing as a well-wisher, Mantra continued, 
Surely you are aware of your husband's plan to install Ram as his successor to the throne. Can't you see how deceitfully your husband has acted? He has merely sent Bharat away so that he can secretly install his pet son Ram on the throne. Once Ram becomes emperor, your son will meet his ruin and you will be plunged into an ocean of despair. How, moreover, because I am... I am dependent on you. Your fortune is also mine. Please let me help you before it is too late. Please act quickly to save your own son, Bharat, and yourself. Kekai was surprised to see her, hear her maidservant speaking so boldly. She replied, I am happy to know that Ram will be installed on the throne as a reward for delivering this wonderful news. Please take this jewel. Indeed, you may ask for anything you desire. Kekai placed a priceless jewel in Mantara's hand, but the maidservant threw it aside. Mantara indignantly replied, I am shocked to see that you can express joy on the eve of disaster. Passing over Bharat to choose Ram should be a great insult to you. You may imagine that you are Dashrath's favourite. However, in truth, it is Kaushalya's whom he adores. Don't you feel humiliated? You imagine that you are happy, but it will be Kaushalya's who prospers. Once Ram becomes king, you will be compelled to act as Kaushalya's maidservant and Bharat will be forced to become Ram's slave. In this way, Kekai's heart gradually became poisoned by Mantra's hateful words. Indeed, when her enviousness of Kaushalya was fully aroused, her face became flushed with anger. Thus Kekai relented, saying, Mantra, perhaps you're right. Somehow Ram must be banished to the forest so that my own son can be installed on the throne. Please tell me how I might accomplish this. Mantra then related how Dashrath had formerly fought on the side of Indra against the demons, headed by some Shambara. Because Shambara knew so many illusory tricks, the demigods were afraid to fight with him. Once again, after the demon had severely routed the demigod, Dashrath led an attack on the capital city, Vajanta. Although he fought heroically, Dashrath was critically wounded during the battle and fell unconscious. Kekai then removed him from the battlefield and saved his life out of deep gratitude. Maharaj Dashrath offered Kekai two boons. However, she replied that she would ask for him when needed. Mantra then said, Now is the time to ask for those promised boons. With one you will ask that Bharat be installed to the throne and with the other demand that Ram be banished to the forest for 14 years. Ram's absence will give Bharat the opportunity to establish his popularity among citizens. Then his position as rightful ruler will be secure. Then Mantra further instructed Kekai saying, Go to the sulking cham chamber. And throwing off your costly ornaments and royal dress, put on an old dirty clothes and lie on the cold floor. Then Maharaj Dashrath comes to see you. Remain silent at first. However, don't worry, his attachment to you is so great that he will not be able to bear seeing you unhappy. He will do anything to pacify you. Regardless, keep your ambition firmly fixed in your mind. You will not settle for anything less than having your son installed on the throne. Do not allow him to pacify you with gold jewels or anything else. Simply remind him of the two boons he promised. When he consents to this, then you shall demand that Bharat be installed immediately and Ram banished to the fire. Because her fickle heart had come completely under the sway of malice and greed, Kekai was delighted with Mantra's plan. She assured the maidservant that she would follow her advice to the letter. Indeed, through her twisted association, Kekai had become obsessed with the idea of making Bharat the emperor of the world. And we will continue from there here onwards tomorrow. And I will take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Dashara again. Hare Krishna and thanks for joining. Hare Amtatsa.